Men were mining the earth even before recording their own history. The early miners were tough and proud of their craft. Their tools were primitive, the dangers were great, but their approach was surprisingly advanced. To mine rock in the 1200s, miners built underground fires which heated and fractured the rock when doused with cold water. In the 1600s, black powder was first used as a mining tool. To build bigger tunnels faster, simple hand tools evolved into primitive pneumatic drills which were used to break the rock and bore holes for dynamite. To speed tunneling, multiple drills were placed on a jumbo rig so several drills could work simultaneously at the work face. As tunnels crossed rivers and penetrated mountains, the timber frames that for centuries were used to brace tunnel walls were no longer sufficient. In 1818, an important new tunneling concept was developed. It was the Brunel Shield, a huge iron cylinder that protected the tunnelers from cave-ins at the dangerous work face of the tunnel. The Brunel Shield was first used in 1827 to drive a tunnel halfway under the Thames River in London. Today, contractors on Metropolitan Washington's future rapid rail transit, the Metro, are using improved steel shields to construct earth tunnels through parts of the downtown areas. This 21-foot shield, weighing 85 tons, will protect the miners as they drive the tunnel path. Here, near the Potomac River, a work crew prepares to lower a shield into position. With attention to safety, the men inspected both crane cables and replaced one that was slightly frayed to avoid any possibility of accident. The shield was then positioned and lowered with egg crate precision down a construction shaft under the eyes of experienced supervisors. Having reached the dark subsoil for which it was designed, the shield was ready to do its job, deposit a new lake in the metro system. In another part of Washington, below historic Lafayette Park, which had just been restored by the National Park Service, another tunnel was being constructed. The shield method of tunneling was also used for this segment of line that would run beneath Lafayette Park in front of the White House and the Treasury. The Metro, when in full operation in 1980, will move thousands of riders daily in quiet comfort and will preserve, unmarred, the dignified plan of our nation's capital. Two blocks from the White House, a specially designed mining machine was at work inside a huge shield. This mining machine was capable of driving a full-face tunnel ten times faster and many times safer than men working with hand tools. The course of the tunnel was charted to the accuracy of a fraction of an inch using a safe, low-powered laser beam. Inside the shield, the machine operator controlled the push-button operation of the mining machine. Twenty hydraulic jacks behind the shield pushed it into the work face with a force of 3,600 tons. A claw and bucket on an articulated boom, like a man's hand and arm, scooped earth from the work face and dumped it onto a conveyor belt. 125 feet behind the machine, the muck dropped from the conveyor belt into muck cars, each holding eight tons of rock and dirt. The muck train, pulled by a small diesel engine, trundled along on a narrow gauge track temporarily laid by tunnel workers rumbled through the initial tunnel shell formed by steel ring sets and wood lagging. The muck train emerged from the tunnel and its hoppers were quickly hoisted to waiting trucks on the street. The trucks carried the muck to new and useful purposes, such as sanitary landfills and park landscaping projects. When men and machines finished opening the earth tunnel, Preparations began for casting the reinforced concrete that formed the finished tunnel walls. Beneath G Street, 
A huge underground concrete mixing plant was constructed to ensure the freshest concrete mix. Special agitator cars carried concrete to the tunnel form from this subterranean mixing plant. During mixing and loading, a fine spray formed a water curtain to contain concrete dust. Under the control of experts, the aggregate and additives were mixed with cement and then loaded into agitator cars. The loaded cars rolled back up the tunnel to the site of placement, churning the concrete mix all the way. Concrete was then dumped onto conveyor belts, which carried it into a powerful pump, which, using compressed air, forced the concrete through pipes and into the form. Here, the inverts, or the floor slabs of the tunnel, were being poured. Working under strenuous pressures of humidity, noise, dirt, and time schedules, the men accomplished their mission with uncompromising accuracy and good humor. While the inverts were being placed, welders prepared the rebars, or steel reinforcements for the tunnel walls. After the rebars were installed, the electrical conduits were set in the walls, and the walls were ready to be poured. The walls were cast by a huge movable form that moved up the tunnel in stages. Its movable sides were expanded to fit the side of the finished tunnel. The concrete was pumped into the mold, filling all the space between the timber lagging and the steel form. In this manner, a 15-inch thick ring of concrete and steel formed the tunnel wall. After the concrete had set, the form was pulled away from the new section and moved down the tunnel for the next pour. The inbound section of the A2 tunnel was then nearly complete. Later, when the adjoining tunnel was completed, Twin tunnels were cleaned out and made ready for the track leg. The technology of tunnel construction has advanced much since the days of the pick and shovel. Lasers, engines, new materials, new techniques have caused the earth to open up for our increased needs. But the tunnel men of today share with their predecessors of the early tunnels a respect born of experience for the earth in which they work.